Okay, welcome everybody to Illinois Learn to Hunt presents Bird Dog 101. Uh, just a few things before we get started tonight. You do not need your microphone, so you can stay on mute. Uh, everybody who's entered into the webinar is already on mute, so you can keep that off. You also don't need to turn on your webcam at all, um, so we can reduce any background noise or any, uh, any background webcams that might pop up. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation as we work through this. Uh, so with that, we are, this is a third of our round this past month of uh, partnering with Pheasants Forever. So we had Upland 101 and 102, and now we're closing out with Bird Dog 101. So again, uh, Pheasants Forever, if you're interested in working with them or joining a chapter, uh, volunteering and helping out with some habitat um, preservation and management, um, you can look up their information there. And we will have some Pheasants Forever members on uh, tonight, so they'll talk a little bit more about that. Our course outline this evening is going to be um, the benefits of hunting with a dog while upland hunting. Uh, this is really a podcast, not podcast, a webinar about uh, how to hunt around bird dogs and how to how to hunt over dogs and the safety factor of that and um, the different aspects of this. So that's what we're kind of focusing on tonight. And uh, we will talk a little bit about training at the end, but it's not really a training webinar. It's more just uh, hunter etiquette and safety. Uh, so we start off talking a little bit about safety. Then we're gonna talk about the different types of bird dogs between the flushing breeds and the pointing breeds. And we'll go deep dive into that and the different hunting strategies of using both. And then we'll hit up on some equipment that you might want. And again, a little bit of that training and how to find someone with a dog if you don't have one at the very end. And again, we'll have time at the end for question and answering. Uh, this is gonna be a shorter one of our webinars. So we will have a lot of time left for the question and answering. And we do have some experts on tonight. So hopefully you can have some questions for them. Uh, so we have our regular presenter, present, presenters on uh, with us from Learn to Hunt. So with us, we have Dan. Dan, you'd like to say hi. Hello everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. And then Adam, uh, would you like to say hi? How's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining us and hope you guys enjoy tonight's webinar. Yes. And then that leaves me. I'm Jason. And again, we're just a regular Learn to Hunt staff and uh, we're happy to be putting on these webinars for you all. Uh, with us tonight, we do have some uh, special guests. So Katie, would you like to say hi and a little bit about uh, yourself and your background? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Katie Kozlich. I am the Illinois Outreach Coordinator for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever in Illinois. Um, I've had about all, all 34 years of my, or 33 years of my life, I've had Boykin Spaniels, um, which are a flushing dog breed. My family has hunted them my whole life. Um, I've also for about 25 years had Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retrievers, which are another type of flusher. Um, but never actually actively hunted with them, um, even though my family used them for hunting um, until I actually got this job at Pheasants Forever and picked up hunting. So um, for the last few years, I've been learning how to work dogs I've known all my life as hunting dogs and um, been really enjoying getting out in the field and doing something new with them that I never would have done before that. So. Awesome. Uh, and then also with us tonight, we have Matt. Matt, would you like to say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey everybody, how you doing? Um, I am the owner of Overall Retriever Training. We uh, train retrievers, pretty much self-explanatory. I'm also the president of our local chapter uh, for Pheasants Forever, Lake County Pheasants Forever. Um, have been for the last six years, I think, maybe even seven, not sure. Um, but I'm happy to be a part of this group to, uh, to help talk more about the, uh, the flushing breeds, something near and dear to my heart. Great. All right. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, last but not least, we have Perry. Perry, would you like to say hi and a little bit sure. about yourself? Sure. Thank you. Um, I've been, you know, I got my first uh, short hair uh, 15 years ago, just a family pet. And I you know, didn't have any experience with hunting or bird dog training, but he has uh, changed my life. So I am an amateur. I'm uh, president of the German Short Hair Pointer Club of Illinois. And um, I've appreciate the opportunity to be on this tonight and share uh, just a lot of the enjoyment that I've gotten over hunting over bird dogs. And I actually want to give Matt some credit. Uh, I heard him on a podcast and 
he has said something. He said, dogs are the bridge to new hunter recruitment. And I've sort of adopted that. And I, that's what I think is going to be a lot of the value of this, this seminar tonight. So, Dan, I want to, Matt, I want to thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Thanks for remembering. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> I've been taking credit for it, too, but that's okay. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, and then thank you all for, for joining us tonight as well. And uh, we're excited about this webinar. So we're going to get it going. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Dan. So go ahead, Dan. Perfect. Thanks, Jason. And um, just to, to kind of reiterate a point that Jason made is, is this webinar is going to be structured a little bit different than, than the majority of ours, if, you, if you've kind of sat in these before. Um, typically, you know, we kind of follow right along a, a traditional pathway through the, the, the PowerPoint presentation. But today, since we have a lot of guest speakers and a lot of, you know, really successful bird trainer or bird dog trainers and, and hunters, we're going to try to make this a little bit more conversational um, and, and hope that, that we can provide, you know, different and unique viewpoints. Uh, but first of all, we're just going to discuss, you know, what is upland hunting with a dog? Um, and the, the big advantage and the, the benefits of upland hunting with a, a well-trained bird dog are, are fairly numerous. Um, you know, you have your, your field bred dogs like short hairs, labs, um, spaniels, um, and these can exponentially increase your chances of, of finding birds as well as recovering those birds after, after your shot. Um, so the, the act of hunting with a, with a bird dog can be extremely personal, particularly if it's your, your own bird dog. Uh, but even, you know, hunting over somebody else's dog can be really advantageous to, again, watch that dog work. A lot of times that's, you know, my favorite part of a, a bird hunt is watching how those dogs work, how they push birds around and how they retrieve. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And you can also, you know, tap into this connection that you can, you know, build a working relationship with your dog. And it's really impactful when you see a handler with their dog in, in that that level of, of communication, that level of connection, almost the, the fluency that they work um, is, is extremely beautiful. And it's a, it's a lot of fun to watch. Um, and you can also, again, discover a, a kind of deeper understanding of your dog. But before we, we dive into the, the bulk of this presentation, we do wanna just kind of reemphasize um, some key safety um, points. And now the, these certainly aren't, you know, fire, firearm safety. Um, these are more specific to actually hunting with a, a bird dog. Um, obviously, we always need to keep the, the basics of, of firearm safety in mind, but these are going to be, you know, specifically stated um, to, to bird dogs. So the, the big one is you never want to have a loaded gun pointing down. Remember, we're hunting oftentimes in very tall grass prairie fields, and those dogs are going to be running, you know, in front of you, next to you, behind you. And so you want to make sure the muzzle of your, your firearm is up in the air and pointed in a safe direction at all time. Another big one is don't lean your gun against a vehicle. Um, I've been guilty of this a lot, not necessarily when I'm working with a bird dog, just kind of, you know, anecdotally when you're out there, it's just a nice place to set it down. But when you are working with a bird dog, there's a very good chance that dog um, is going to bump that firearm and knock it on the ground. So don't leave that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, against the vehicle. And if you're using a, a break open firearm, so that can be an over under, or a side-by-side -side where the, the action kind of breaks open, um, you want to keep that action open until the dog kind of indicates that a, that a bird is present. Um, you also do not want to shoot directly over a dog. You want to position yourself to the side, um, and we'll get into that a, a lot in a, in a little bit. Um, you also need to, to watch that the dog is not jumping up to try to catch a low-flying bird. Um, as, as you know, as we progress through this, this presentation, um, and we get to the, the flushing breeds, you'll, you'll understand there's a tendency um, for, for flushing dog breeds to, to kind of jump up and, and try to catch the bird. So you want to make sure that bird is high enough in the sky and that that dog is not trying to actively catch that bird before you take the shot. Um, and immediately after your shot, you want to always return your firearm to a safe position. Also, Dan, before we get going, I know I put it in the chat, but uh, for anyone who has questions throughout the presentation, uh, you can put that in the chat box and uh, someone, uh, Adam, will answer your question in the chat or the person presenting will uh, answer it via microphone. And th this is a, a really important graphic to illustrate the, the overall importance of, of how to properly carry your firearm when you're pheasant hunting. 
Um, and as you can see, none of these individuals have their finger anywhere near the trigger. So it's not inside the trigger guard, it's not on the trigger. Um, it's kind of a, a nice safe carry, but also look at the directionality of their muzzles. So the two individuals on the outside are pointing their firearms away. And I know this seems obviously kind of basic, um, but, but I can assure you when you're out in the field, um, you need to always be cognizant of where every single hunter is in your party um, and make sure that muzzle is always pointing in a safe direction. Now, th this is kind of my, my favorite rule of thumb um, for making sure that bird is, is kind of elevated enough before you take the shot. Um, like I mentioned previously, um, some breeds have a tendency to try to jump in the air and catch that bird as they're flushing it. And so you wanna make sure that it's high enough in the sky um, so that there's nothing in front of or beyond your target. Because um, in addition to that, that dog kind of jumping and leaping up, um, you also, again, need to be cognizant of where the other hunters in your party are. And so allowing that bird to get high enough in the sky and elevated enough ensures that you have that, that safe coverage and that there's nothing in front of or behind your shot. And so what I like to try to remember is blue sky beneath the belly. If I'm able to see blue sky beneath the belly of that bird, um, chances are it's gonna be high enough in the sky to, to take an, a safe shot. A few other uh, key things to remember, particularly if you're, you're hunting with um, somebody else's dog and you're hunting with a handler, um, there's some things that, that you need to keep in mind uh, to keep everybody safe, as well as to, to have an effective and successful hunt. Um, again, always practice extreme firearm safety, but also do not give the commands or encouragement to the dog while it's hunting. You wanna let the dog focus on that, that task at hand. So that dog is going to, again, he has a task at hand. He's trained to do um, and to work a field in a very particular and specific way. And giving them commands during that time, uh, especially if you're not the handler, um, can kind of break that, that focus. Um, many dogs uh, will also bring recovered birds only to the handler. Um, I know when I, when I first went out with a handler when I was a young kid, I tried to immediately take the bird that I, that I shot away from the dog. And that dog instantly got very upset um, started growling and they're there again they have that really strong bond and that strong relationship with the handler um, so typically that dog is going to take that bird only to the handler um, so again just don't try to immediately attempt to, to reach and grab that that bird from the dog um, again don't shoot at low flying birds um, or birds that that may be um, kind of it, it may be if you lost the dog um, you lost your line of sight of the dog Again, if it's a low lying bird, you don't wanna take that shot. You always wanna make sure it's high enough in the sky that nothing is in front of or behind um, your target. Now, if you are going out with an experienced handler, it's always good to discuss these things with them. Again, they have this really strong working relationship with that dog. They know how the dog works. The dog knows how the, the hunter wants them to work. And so being cognizant of that and having that conversation upfront with the handler can be very impactful and can essentially ensure that you have a, a very safe and successful hunt. Yeah, I'll, if I could interject one other thing for safety, it's uh, if you're using like an, uh, a break open gun an over under or side by side, when you close that gun and to, to move in to work the bird, be sure to turn away when you close it. If there's uh, gonna be a misfire, that's when it's gonna happen. And I've had, you know, I've had to remind people like they're, they're watching the dog, they're facing forward, and they close the gun. And, and I've had a gun um, misfire with that. It basically would go pretty much right where the dog is right in front of you. So um, I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, that's a great point. Great point, Perry. Thank you. <clears throat> and now we're going to start diving into the, the kind of overall theme of this presentation is how do we effectively, safely, and successfully hunt over bird dogs. Um, one of the biggest and most important aspects of hunting with a bird dog is playing the correct wind. Um, and as you can see in this, this illustration, you want to be hunting, you know, into the wind. Uh, but obviously, uh, Perry gave a, a really good analogy when I was talking to him um, a few days ago in preparation for this webinar. And he mentioned that you can kind of view it like a, a bowling alley or a bowling lane. Um, if you're working just directly straight into that incoming wind, that dog is only smelling what is in that individual bowling lane in front of them. Whereas you can see in this illustration, they like to work kind of across the wind so that they can work back and forth and kind of search 
all of those quote unquote bowling alleys um, of scent. And so the reason we, we use the wind direction is it pushes the, the bird's scent to the dog so that he can start to, to locate and find out where that bird is. Um, another really important aspect of wind direction is that it allows for a somewhat of a, a stealthier approach to the birds. Um, if you're hunting with the wind kind of at your back, um, a lot of times that wind will kind of carry your, your sound um, and, and basically carry that sound directly to the bird and they can start to, to get a little more cautious. They can hear it a little bit sooner. And so maybe they, they start running or they start walking and just kind of pushing forward. Um, so having that, that wind direction to where it's kind of in your face with that dog working across um, is very, very fruitful. Now there's a couple other things to keep in mind when we're hunting with, with bird dogs. Um, in heavy woods or extremely tall cover, um, a lot of times you don't wanna take that, that shot. It's very hard for the dogs to, to find those birds and to get in there. And so be selective about where you are taking um, your shots. We don't wanna shoot over a roadway. We don't wanna shoot in another hunter's field or on private property. Um, don't shoot on the, the other side of a fence or over, open water or ice. Um, but another really key thing to, to remember, particularly with pheasants, is they're very notorious for this. Um, they're very notorious for, instead of flushing up and flying, very often they're just going to essentially start running ahead of you. So they'll just start running. Um, but keep in mind, we do not, do not, do not shoot at pheasants that are on the ground. Um, again, it's, it's very unsafe because you never know where everything is. The dog is out there running around in this very tall grass. So we always want to get those birds up in the air um, before we, we take that shot. So now we're going to, to dive into the, the two big groups um, of bird dogs. So we have the flushing breeds and pointing breeds. And the biggest distinction between the two is the way that they essentially work. Um, so a flushing breed is going to try to locate birds and push them up into the air, where a pointing breed is more likely to locate the bird and hold point and basically indicate where that bird is to allow the hunters to move into position to flush the bird themselves. Um, so you can kind of think of it, a, a flushing dog, he's, his one job is to get that bird up in the air as quick as possible. A pointing breed, he's going to indicate where that bird is so then the hunters can kind of prepare and then move in to, to flush the bird themselves. Now th this key distinction leads to, to some very different tactics that, that we use when hunting over these dogs. Um, pointing breeds, you can allow them to, to range a little bit further because again, when a flushing breed flushes a bird, typically you don't have a lot of warning. Um, it's just going to maybe start looking a little at or animated and, and start getting a little like, oh, I'm getting excited, there's a bird here and that bird's just gonna flush. And so flushing breeds need to work a lot closer to the hunter so that when they do inevitably flush that bird, it's still within your, your kind of effective range with your shotgun. Um, if you were to allow that, that flushing breed to work, you know, 50 to 60 yards ahead of you, well, he's just going to be flushing birds out there all day and you don't have a, a chance of, of getting a shot just because, again, it's outside of that effective range with your shotgun. So the pointing breeds, again, they're going to indicate where that bird is um, and that allows them to, to range further. And it, it, this is where it kind of gets into a little nuanced, but an experienced pointer breed is able to essentially hold its distance and not pressure that bird to either run or flush. Um, so an experienced pointer wants to hold that bird there until the, the hunters get there. Um, a, a less experienced pointer, he may start creeping in on that point and it might flush the bird just a little bit. But again, with an experienced dog, he's gonna indicate where that bird is and he's gonna hold that point until the hunters come up, move in and then flush the bird. And the, this is a, a really important aspect of, of hunting over a, a bird dog. And this, this is probably, arguably, I think one of the, the cooler parts of, of watching a handler and a, a dog work is the, this concept of the dog getting birdie. Um, and I want to define this early in the, the presentation because you'll hear us using it throughout the presentation. It's important to kind of define it up front. Uh, but essentially when a dog's getting birdie, it's kind of this animated movement um, that essentially lets... The, the handler and the hunters know that that bird, that bird dog is essentially on scent. So he has found the scent of a bird. Um, and this is where it gets really cool watching a, a dog and a handler work is they have the, the ability to pick up on very minute 
behaviors and, and little changes in that dog's behavior and, and how it's wagging its tail or flipping its ears to pick up on that, that dog is getting birdie. I, I've been on countless hunts where I'm like, oh, okay, we're just kind of walking around and the handler looks over, oh, he's getting birdie. And if, if you don't have that experience working with that dog, you may not notice. Um, so again, when they're getting birdie, you're going to look for this animated movement from their tails. So they're going to start wagging their tails um, sort of fast. And you also want to look for the, the nose to the ground. Again, they're, they're not kind of, a lot of times they're, when they get really close to the bird, they're trying to find ground scent. Um, as, as they get, you know, further away from a bird, then they might be focusing on some of the aerial scent. But the closer and closer they get to that bird, the more prevalent that ground scent is going to be. Um, so very often you will see that that kind of nose to the to the ground. Um, and again, this just gives the hunters a warning that, hey, this dog is is on scent. He's likely near a bird. Um, and that that kind of allows you to, to begin the, the next process and, and how you're going to handle um, that particular bird. Um, actually, I have a, a quick question for Perry. If you could just kind of quickly describe what what some of your your pointers look like when they start to get a little bit birdie? Uh, sure. As you as you said, like as they're initially making scent, you're going to see them become more animated. Uh, they may go back and forth where they're trying to uh, narrow it down. So scent is kind of like smoke, where it the further you get from from the bird, it starts to spread out more. And what they're going to do is they're going to work back and forth and just try and narrow their focus down. As they get closer, and again, you are talking about experience dogs, um, they, they'll start slowing down and then they'll actually lock up. So whereas that tail is gonna be very animated at first, as they get closer to that bird, that tail is gonna stop and then they're, they're gonna freeze. That, that freezing is, is basically, it's like a, it's a stalk, it's like a, like if you ever watch the coyote in a field and they they pause right before they pounce. So what we what we do the the pointing they're born with that they're born with that instinct. We we just instill the obedience that they don't get to jump on you know they don't get to jump in on the bird themselves. They just hold it and designate where it is for us. Excellent. Um, yeah, so now we're going to really dive into to pointing braids and we're going to discuss how you're going to tactically and strategically hunt over um, a, a pointing breed. Um, again, just to reiterate, pointing breeds are going to indicate the presence of a bird by, by freezing in place. Um, the dog is going to hold that point and allow the handlers to move in front of the dog. Um, that, that's a key distinction there, in front of the dog um, to, to flush the bird. Again, like I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, less experienced pointing breeds may start to, to creep in on that point a little bit and kind of eventually flush that bird themselves. But as they become more experienced and as they, they work more in you know, direct hunting scenarios with their handler, they're going to build up that experience and be able to, to hold a point uh, much stronger so that that bird doesn't start to either move um, or you know, so that they don't inadvertently um, flush that bird before the hunters are in position to, to flush it themselves. And so here's a, just a, a quick list of some popular pointing breeds, just so you can quickly get a, an understanding of the, the, the types of dogs and the breeds of dogs that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're discussing when we're using the term pointing breeds. Um, so you have the American Brittany, the English Setters, um, your short hair pointer, your wire hair pointer, um, your English pointer, your Weimariner. Um, and so there's, a, again, a lot of different pointing breeds out there. There's just a, a quick list to, to show a few of those species uh, before we kind of dive into to how you would hunt over a, a pointing breed. And Travis, I did see your question, and that is towards the end of the presentation that we'll kind of get into a little bit of the, the training type things. Um, so we will definitely address that um, once, once we get there. And so if you can think back to, to that slide that showed the, this kind of, you know, flowing pattern across the field that, that's kind of working into that, that crosswind. Um, when a bird dog, when a, when a pointing breed goes on point, you want to watch where that dog's head is to essentially determine the distance and direction of the bird. So it can give you a really good indication of exactly where that dog thinks that bird is. Um, and so typically a high head 
is going to mean that that bird's about 10 to 20 feet in front of the dog. Now, the, the lower that, that dog's head gets, so obviously he's looking closer to the ground, that's going to, again, mean that, that that bird is likely a lot closer to the dog um, than if his head was kind of up and held high. Um, and you can also, again, kind of follow those eyes to, to essentially point out exactly where that bird is. So using the eyes and kind of the angle of the head, you can kind of triangulate exactly where that, that dog thinks that that bird is. Yeah, if I could jump in, so a lot of yes, times, please. With, uh, thank you, with, with, with new hunt, when I've taken new hunters out and, you know, I'll, I'll have them go in and flush the bird and they're looking for the bird, you, you are not, and I'm sure uh, Matt will agree, you are not going to see that bird. Uh, they're very well camouflaged, uh, the cover could be tall, you could have a dog uh, pointing into four feet of cover, I mean, he could be way over his head. So just kind of, you know, look at their head position and start walking forward and be ready for that bird to come up. But it's, it's pretty rare that you'll actually, you know, that you'll actually see the pheasant where you're going to move in. Most of the time they're going to flush before you get, uh, before you get that close to them to see them. That's a, that's a great point. And now <clears throat> as that dog is on point and you kind of start, you know, moving forward, um, the dog may start to, to relax or he may start to, to kind of shift his focus and start looking around. Um, if that happens, chances are that's an indication that that bird is, has started to, to move, um, whether it's kind of running or just kind of walking, trying to, to sneak away. Um, chances are if that dog starts to relax that point that that bird has, has started to, to kind of shift and started to move. Now, an, an experienced bird dog, an experienced pointer, um, I should say, will start to, to kind of relocate and, and essentially start to, to pin that bird down. And so oftentimes it might take where you have to, to start, you know, moving forward with that, that dog as that pheasant, instead of flushing for whatever reason, um, he may just start running. Again, pheasants are a, a type of ground nesting bird. So they've evolved to, to be on the ground. So flight is in a lot of cases, their, their last stretch effort um, for safety. And so if they feel really secure in that area and it's, it's really good cover, chances are they, they don't like to flush until last second they have to. And so it's very common to, to when, a, when a dog's on point that that bird may just start kind of walking or running a little bit. And so you need to be ready to, to kind of follow it and, and be prepared um, to, to follow that, that dog as he continues to, to track that bird. Um, and so as that bird is kind of moving, if it's starting to run again, um, you want to slowly close the distance. If it's, again, holding a, a nice solid point, um, that's when you can really start to, to close the distance. And do you, again, you do want to be somewhat methodical and somewhat um, the opposite of careless. I can't really think of the word. Um, but you want to be, again, just diligent with, with where you're walking. Um, you don't want to walk in front of where that bird is. Um, you want to keep it you know, exactly where it's kind of help hold point. You want to do it silently. Um, the, if you start walking really loud, you may again flush that bird from further back. And so it might take, you know, a, a little effort to, to kind of stealthily approach um, that, that bird. And now when that, once that, that bird is on, or that bird dog is on point and he's holding that point really strong, um, that's when you're going to start moving in for the shot. And again, like I just mentioned, the, the more noise you make, the chances are for that bird to flush increases. And so you wanna be prepared to flush um, kind of at any moment. But again, you wanna approach, as you can kind of see in this diagram, you want to approach from the side, because like we mentioned earlier on in the, the safety briefing, you do not, do not, do not wanna shoot directly over top of that dog. Um, so getting you know, to the side and getting adjacent to it as quick as you can, so that if that bird does happen to flush a little bit earlier, um, you can still get a safe and effective shot. Um, you want to keep your gun in the ready position. Um, so a, a good way to, to kind of describe that is you want the, the butt of the firearm kind of in your armpit. Um, you don't want to go in with it pointed, you know, straight up at the sky as you're kind of slowly walking in. You want to be a nice, comfortable, safe position. Um, and again, finger off the trigger and finger off out of the trigger guard. Um, I will say this is when um, it, it's really important to pay attention to your footing. Again, the adrenaline is going to start pumping a little bit um, because, again, you're in a, a hunting scenario. You finally found a bird. You're ready to move in for the flush. You need to still pay attention to all your basic safety things and as well as the footing. Because, um, again, 
where we're hunting pheasants and quail, it's very often these tall grass prairies. Um, and there's a lot of kind of thatch at the, at the ground level. So that's just dead grass and sticks and things. It's, it's really easy to, to trip. And again, that's why we keep the, the finger out of the trigger guard. Because if you think about it, what's the, the human body's natural tendency if you were to fall? The natural tendency of your entire body is to clench kind of every muscle. Your, your hands clench, your teeth, your legs, everything starts to clench. And if you have that finger anywhere near the trigger as you're falling and you're, again, your natural reflex is to tense up and clinch, um, that can cause a, a negligent discharge. So keep that finger out of the trigger guard and off the, the trigger as you're approaching um, that bird. Again, you can determine where you think that bird is by the, the directionality and the height of the, the pointer's head. Um, and then again, watch for the bird to flush from cover. Um, I've taken a, a few new hunters out and they've, you know, spent time hunting or, you know, shooting clays, shooting sporting clays, and they're always looking up. Well, the bird's not going to come. I know it seems basic, but even I struggle with this at times. I'm always looking up. That bird is going to flush from the ground. And again, like Perry mentioned, you're, you're not going to see that bird. Um, there's been very, very many cases where I could have stepped on a bird um, before it, it decided to flush. And I would have never seen it just because of how good they are camouflaged. Um, so again, watch for them to flush from the cover. So be looking towards the ground, towards where you think that bird is in anticipation of that flush. Now pheasants, again, like I previously mentioned, they prefer to run when being pursued. And so you may, again, expect the dog to, to kind of have to relocate. Um, and I'm gonna have Perry kind of discuss that process a little bit um, after I finish the, these next few bullets. Um, you also might have an instance where the pheasant may kind of double back behind the dog and you may have to kind of reposition your entire hunt um, to, to try to track down that bird. Um, again, they want to take the, last, the, the path of least resistance um, when they're, they're being pursued. So Perry, if you could give us a, kind of a, a quick explanation on, on kind of what it looks like when a, when a, a pointing breed is, is kind of tracking a running bird and kind of how you would navigate that that scenario in the field. Sure. So, and again, this would be an experienced dog. And, and a lot of it is, you know, if you have the opportunity to hunt with someone with an experienced dog, it, it's, it's just fascinating to sit back and, and watch the dog and, and just all the natural abilities that they have. But with the pointing dog, you'll see it, it'll, it'll lock up. It'll, you know, you'll see the dog, um, you know, very still, almost frozen. And as you move in, is if that bird's moved, and again, just you just have to be ready. It, it's not like uh, like sporting clays or trap. There's there's no yelling pull. Uh, you know that bird can go up at pretty much at any time because it, it knows you're there. I mean, it, it hears you. It hears you coming. It senses that the dog is there. Um, and you'll see the dog sometimes as you approach it. It'll relax a little bit and it will relocate. Um, I've had, it is not unusual. In fact, I was uh, guiding yesterday. I mean, we tracked this bird 200 yards. Uh, it just, it didn't want to fly and it, and it didn't want to stop. And you'll see the dog creep forward, stop, relax a little bit, creep forward, stop, relax. And it, you know, again, it's almost, it's, it's almost like, like poetry. It's like a ballet with an experienced dog. And what you wanna do, again, is staying aware of your surroundings. You know, you're gonna, the, your terrain is gonna change. You know, you don't wanna be running, but you do wanna try and stay, keep up with the dog, maybe even stay in front of it a little bit. If you're with partners, you know, you'll be with a, another, with a, a handler at least. If, if there's a third person, you almost try to stay in funnel funnel that bird, you know, maybe even get in front of the dog a little bit and give that bird a reason to finally flush. Um, you know, and again, like you're a team, you're working as a team with the dog. So the other thing I would encourage people to do is practice, actually practice that, you know, with an unloaded gun, uh, you, know, you could shoot trap, you could shoot sporting clays. Uh, it's a totally different game. It is mounting the gun while you're, while you're moving. And for a lot of, you know, while you're sort of looking down instead of looking up, while your surroundings are changing, 
the, the entire time while you're paying attention to the dog. So the one thing that you can do on your own time is again, with an unloaded gun, uh, practice moving forward, pretending there's a dog in front of you, then quickly mounting, mounting the gun and getting ready for a shot. So does that cover what you were looking for? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yep, excellent, thank you. And a, a, a real big thing that I, that I wanna highlight here when, when we're talking about the, these runners, so again, this is very common with pheasants, um, is pay attention to the habitat that they're moving through. Um, if there's kind of a, a lack of habitat in front, so maybe the habitat just ends, maybe you're hunting a prairie strip and you're working towards a cut cornfield and that, that field is just empty. The second that bird gets really close to the end of the habitat, expect it to flush. Um, so that's a, a very common strategy when you're kind of hunting these, these runners, quote unquote, is to try to, to either steer them or, or push them to an area that's going to essentially force them to flush. Um, it can be kind of a, a big blockade of, of maybe thick timber that's going to force it, force it to flush because maybe it doesn't want to go in there. But often cases, it's just that habitat kind of ends. So there's a, a kind of a, a change in cover that forces that bird to, to finally make the decision, okay, it's time to flush. Um, and so, so kind of be looking, looking out for those, those scenarios as you are kind of tracking these, these runners. And now if that, that bird holds still and you have a nice solid point, um, again, this is the, the preferred scenario. It's not necessarily always the, the most likely scenario when you're hunting um, pheasants. Um, but when that dog is holding a, a very strong point, you want to start to move in for the shot. Now, if, if there are multiple hunters present, um, this is where you, you kind of rely on the handler. So the way I like to describe it is the person, the, the dog handler, is kind of in charge of that hunting line. Um, again, it's very oftentimes their dog, they know how their dog hunts, they know how their dog works. And it's just nice to have somebody who kind of acts as a, a leader, quote unquote, of that line. Um, and so this is when you're going to, to kind of rely on the handler's direction. Um, he's either going to, to tell you guys to, to get ready to, for, for a flush, or he might call somebody over and say, you come in from this direction and flush that bird. But again, remember, we're trying to do it from kind of an adjacent perspective of the dog. We do not want to take a shot directly over the top of that dog. And now when you do flush the bird, again, we want to watch the bird flush from the cover. Don't be looking up in the sky. It's going to start at the ground and flush up. And we want to make sure that he's clearing the sky. So focus on that, that blue sky beneath the belly to make sure that, that that bird is high enough in the sky that there's no danger uh, in your shot and so that you have a safe shot. That just kind of determines there's nothing in front of or behind your target. Um, now, it is important, particularly if you're pheasant hunting, to immediately try and identify the sex of that bird. And now there are some distinctions if you're hunting, let's say the Illinois controlled pheasant site, controlled pheasant hunting program sites, those sites do allow for the harvest of female pheasants, so of hens. But if you're hunting wild birds, you can only harvest male roosters. And so that's why it's really important for everybody on the line, the second they see that bird to flush, the second they see that bird flush and they are able to identify whether it's a hen or a rooster to immediately call out whether it's hen or rooster. That again, just lets everybody on the line know, okay, hen, that means no shot. Rooster, okay, that bird's in play. And so that, that's really common and it's really important when you are hunting with, with a group of hunters. Um, now with quail, that's not as important because again, there aren't these um, basically gender specific um, regulations uh, because again, we can't really ID them from, a, from afar. Um, so with, with quail, you just need to be able to identify that that's actually a quail um, that is flushing up in front of you. Another thing that's really important to, to keep in mind when that bird does flush, patience. Um, I know when I first started upland hunting, I was very keen on trying to, to get my firearm in a position and to take a shot as quick as I could, just because I thought that's the way it worked. Um, but in reality, you have a lot more time than you think you do. Um, to, so be patient in taking that shot. And again, that, that's really important in terms of, of kind of meat quality as well. If you have a, you know, a male rooster that flies up you know, eight yards in front of you and you hit him with a 12 gauge and you happen to hit it right in the breast, there's going to be very little edible meat left on that bird. And so allowing that bird to get a little bit farther away from you 
allows you to get a nice ethical shot without damaging too much meat. And a lot of that is just due to the way shotguns function. And so as we know, when a shotgun shell leaves the shotgun, it's going to slowly spread. The further out that target is, the, the bigger that spread is. So not only, again, are you potentially saving meat quality by letting it get a little bit further, you're also increasing your chances of actually being um, effective and actually hitting that bird. Because at that point, your shot cloud is much bigger um, than it would be if that bird is really close to, to you as a hunter. So let that bird get out a little bit, um, be patient, you have time. And again, if the bird flushes in an unsafe location or if that dog tries to jump up and, and track that bird or maybe that bird just doesn't get elevated enough, um, sometimes that does happen. Just keep in mind, don't take any unsafe shots. There's gonna be plenty of other opportunities. Um, so just again, patience and make sure you have a safe and ethical shot. Hey, Dan, we got a quick question in the chat. Uh, yep. What is, Benelli asks, what's the smallest shot size steel that would be recommended for pheasant hunting? Uh, Perry, do you want to address that one? Sure. In fact, actually, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing Matt's uh, opinion also. Because with a, a pointing dog, they're generally closer shots, or they're supposed to be closer shots. The dog is, is supposed to try and... Uh, you know, not pressure that bird. So we just went to steel at the Splains. Um, so the rule of thumb, as I understand, is you go two sizes larger. So I would say I've tried to find fives in steel. Um, I, I have not had a lot of success. So I've been using fours and a little bit more of an open choke, like a uh, improved and modified and, and i've and i've even gone to like a, a um ski choke and my I, I use an over under so i have two different barrels two different chokes so that first shot really tends to be fairly close and with training you know we generally don't shoot wild flushes um we you know that's what the dog is for so with a pointing with a well-trained point an experienced pointing dog they're generally pretty pretty close shots. So with lead, I was using sixes, and with steel, I would go to if I could find them, I would go to a, a four, a, a five. But uh, generally, I'm using a four. And I think um, Dan, you you might know. This. I don't think you can use anything larger than a four, but in uh, with the controlled pheasant program. But, uh, I can't really hear you, Perry. You're starting to, to break up oh, a little sorry. bit. Oh, that's all right. But the, the big thing to remember with steel shot, um, like Perry mentioned, is you typically, again, it's a it's less dense than lead. It weighs less. And it's also a much harder metal than lead. Um, but it's also important to remember that steel shot spreads less and has denser shot patterns. And so to compensate for that, whatever you're shooting in lead, um, the equivalent is typically two sizes larger um, than the, the, the lead shot size. Uh, but you also need to, to pay attention to your choke tubes. Um, you wanna make sure that the choke tubes in your firearm are rated to, to be able to use steel shot. Um, and also keep in mind that steel shot spreads less than, less, or than lead ammunition. And so that, that tells us that less choke constriction is needed. Um, so if you're using, you know, maybe you want to step down a, a choke tube size, essentially, when, when switching from, from lead um, to, to steel. I guess also to really answer that question, you have to find out if they're hunting wild bird or pen raised birds, because there is a difference in where the bird is going to go up. For example, South Dakota, if you're hunting wild bird, you're going to want a full size or your full choke. And I would go with a four shot, quite frankly. Yeah, excellent point. Because like he mentioned, those shots are typically going to be a little bit further. And so that allows yeah. you to increase your effective range just a little bit. So that Great would question. be my question. In order to answer that, you'd have to find out what it is they're, they're, uh, they're hunting. Sure. Yeah, so Benelli, if you want to let us know, we can, we can take a, a stab at that on the next one. Um, now, when we get to, to flushing the bird, again, you want to identify the sex as quick as you can. And if it is, in fact, a, a legal game species that you can harvest... Um, and if it's in your safe zone of fire and it's a safe shot, then go ahead and take the shot. Immediately after the shot, return your firearm to the safe position. 
And I will say at this point, it's really important to be calm um, and identify where you last saw that bird go down. It, it can really help either the, the dog or the handler. Um, sometimes, you know, it's hard to find a, a bird and sometimes the dog might struggle to, to kind of get a start on it. And so being able to, to recognize exactly where you last saw that bird go down is really important. So kind of just stay exactly where you're, you're, you're standing, um, take the, the firearm off safety and return it to a safe position or not take it off safety, unload it and put it on safety. Um, and then kind of, again, identify where you last saw that bird go down. So immediately following the shot, a pointing breed is typically going to release its point from the sound of the shot. Um, and Perry can go into to detail a little bit more um, after I go over these last few bullets, but the dog is going to immediately begin tracking the bird um, to attempt to retrieve. So the second he hears that shot, he's going to begin looking for that bird in the sky and trying to pick up on it. And then as he gets closer and closer, he'll start to use that, that nose and try to pinpoint exactly where that bird is um, so that he can retrieve it. Now, if you are just a hunter and you happen to, to be hunting with a handler, do not give commands to the dog. Um, let the handler give the commands at this point because he's going to have commands that can tell the bird maybe or tell the dog to veer left, veer right. And so just keep that in mind. We don't want to be giving commands to the dog um, unless it, we are, in fact, the handler. Now, if it's not a, a, a legal bird or it's a missed shot, um, the, the handler is typically going to give the, the command no bird. And so that's going to indicate to the, to the dog that there was, in fact, no bird and he can essentially cancel his retrieve. Do you have anything to add there, Perry? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, is you know, most pheasant cover is is tall. It's uh, CRP or like CRP, so it is not unusual to be in cover three three feet high, four feet high, or even more. And and with the, again, that's the, the part that's really. I don't know. You could you could hunt without a dog. I have no idea how these guys retrieve their birds without a dog. Um, you, if you shoot a bird and it falls in four feet of cover, you are never going to find that thing w without a dog. Um, and what happens is, depending on the level of training that you have with your dog, if you're doing competitions and uh, testing with a pointing dog, you're general, you're going to try and train them to be steady to shot and fall, where they're going to wait for a command to release them. They know that I'm convinced that they know the difference when they're hunting pheasants or and most of them will, will lose that, that waiting for the punch command and they will break on the shot because they just know that they need to get on that bird quicker. Pheasants don't, well, pheasants don't generally hit the ground dead. Um, if you break a wing, that bird will drop like a rock, but then it'll hit the ground running. So again, what a dog will do is you know, they, they were bred to put to put food on the table. I mean, they were bred for subsistence as well as support. And it's, again, it's not unusual to see a dog track a bird another 20, 30, 100 yards sometimes to recover a, recovery, uh, recover a wounded bird. Excellent, great point. Uh, Benelli also just put in the chat. Um, he says steel shot has been hard to find. So he's had to choose between two shot and six shot for controlled pheasant hunting in Illinois with a young pointer. So just six. want to put that out. Well, well, two is illegal. Yep. If you have to choose between number two and number six, go with number six. And I, I, I do um, share that, that sure. sentiment. Um, it is very hard to, to find steel shot currently. Um, so keep that in mind as you do hunt some of these sites. Some of these sites do require the use of non-toxic shot. Um, there are other metal alloys that, that manufacturers have started to come out with that I have seen a little bit more prominent on the kind of the, the shelves. Um, very often they might be some kind of tungsten alloy or, or some of these other fancier metals. They will be, I will say, they are a more expensive shot. Um, but typically they're going to perform more similar to a lead shot. 
Um, but again, they will be a little more expensive, but you can currently find those um, on shelves, or at least I've, I've been able to um, in my, my local area. You know, there's really no reason you can't use a seven shot. The majority of the clubs in the area, steel, of course, are using seven shot. You just have to be a little quicker with your gun and pay a little more attention to where the bird is. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's the big thing is knowing how your choke tube, how your shot patterns at various different distances. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you do, you know, try a new shot, um, maybe it's a, a brand new shell that you've never used or a brand new alloy or a different shot size, get out there and pattern it. Put a, a, you know, a big piece of paper out at 10 yards, shoot it. Get a new piece of paper at 20 yards, shoot it. 30 yards, shoot it. And then that'll allow you to kind of gauge at what distance that shot selection or that shot shell and choke tube combination is effective. And so that's a, a really necessary step. Um, and something I, I highly recommend. Now, as that dog begins to, to recover the bird, um, again, do not attempt to, to take the dog from the bird unless instructed by the handler. Again, it's very common for, for the dog to only retrieve that bird for the handler. Um, Perry, do, do your dogs give it to, to other hunters or will they only retrieve it to you? The, generally, they'll, they'll retrieve to me. The, the dog I have now is actually pretty accommodating. <laughs> more so than my other ones were. But it's, um, yeah. and I'm doing, I'm doing testing and things with my dog. So, so part of that is that he needs to retrieve that bird to, to hand. So it could get confusing sometimes um, with someone else taking the, trying to take the bird from him. You know, they're not gonna use the same release command. The other thing is, again, most, most a lot, a good deal of the time, that pheasant's still alive. And if you're not used to taking a live bird from the dog, they could drop it, the bird can get away again. Um, you don't want the bird fla you know, flapping and uh, slapping the dog. That's an excellent point. Generally, I, I, generally, I, I would just let the dog, there, there's, I would just let the dog bring it back to the handler. And then at least with me, I'm more than happy to go you know, wherever the carry it, you know, after it's, it's after. sure. Now we're going to move into to flushing breeds. Um, flushing again, flushing breeds will often flush the birds by themselves. That's kind of what they do. Um, they typically will not wait for the hunters. Now I'll let Matt get into a little bit more of the specifics, but a more experienced bird dog can give a little bit more warning to the hunters, but before he's going to flush. Um, and again, that's that term getting birdie that we kind of discussed a little bit earlier. Um, but again, the, the big thing with flushing breeds is that you need to give that bird time to get away from the dog. You want it to get distance and you want it to get elevation because these scenes that you see right here in these two photographs is fairly common um, with, with flushing breeds as they, they kind of launch themselves in the air um, to, to try to grab that bird. So here's a, a couple, just another quick list of some of the more uh, common flushing breeds that, that you're likely to see out there. Um, the American Water Spaniel, the Boykin Spaniel, um, Retrievers. Um, there's, a, again, a lot of different breeds out there that are, that are kind of bred for the sole purpose of being a, a flushing um, breed. Now, Matt, what, what breed of dogs do you typically run? Uh, Labradors. Okay, perfect. So very similar to, to working with a pointer, you still want to work with that, that kind of craw, that wind that's in your face as the hunter, but that dog is going to be, again, doing that kind of a cross path as it tries to, to cover as much of the field and get as much of that, that scent cone from the bird as, as possible. Um, but the big distinction, again, between pointers, between pointing breeds and flushing breeds is how far they can work. So a flushing breed, you want to maintain a close proximity to that dog because again oftentimes you may not have a lot of warning before that dog flushes so you want to make sure you're in a position that you're already within um, your your kind of effective range um, so to speak. Uh, Matt how how close do you keep your 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 dogs to you as as kind of the, the hunter? Well the goal is always within 50 yards because that's usually the most difficult shot uh, depending on what 
the cover is and so on. There's a lot of variables, but 50 yards is our target. Perfect. Excellent. And so again, just very similar to, to a pointing breed and, and Matt can get, go into a little bit more detail about how, you know, he kind of methodically works a, a, a patch of cover. Uh, but again, we want to try to ex extend that scent cone as much as possible to allow that bird or to allow that, that dog um, to, to the best ability to detect where that bird is. Um, so very often you're going to be kind of working across the wind. Um, and again, that allows for the scent to travel, but it also allows for concealment um, between you, the dog and the bird. Um, it allows for a little bit of noise cover, which can keep that bird sitting for just a little bit longer instead of kind of running forward. Now you're, you're typically going to, again, work in tandem with your dog. You don't want the dog to get too far ahead. Um, you want to be, again, like Matt said, kind of within that 50 yards so that if that bird does flush, um, you still have a, a chance to take an effective and kind of ethical shot. Um, the dog, again, is going to work back and forth as it kind of checks the, the ground um, for scent as well as kind of checks the air. Um, and again, just kind of start to, to pay attention to the dog and, and look for them to, to start to get birdie. Um, and, and again, every dog's a little bit different. Um, now, Matt, with your, with your labs, what are some of the, the key characteristics that they exhibit when they're starting to get a, a little bit birdie? The most exciting part of it is watching that tail. Uh, the tail will go from relatively straight, relaxed in a, in a, in a non-circular motion to going just completely crazy. It's a, a <laughs> whirlwind coming right off the top of their butt. And watching them hook when the scent gets stronger, the tail goes nuts. That's when I tell everybody to take your safety off, get ready, there's a bird someplace. Cool. Now, when you're, when you're walking or kind of working through a field, is this a, a fairly good depiction in this graphic of, of kind of the overall dog's path as he's kind of working back and forth in that field? Yeah, I'd say definitely. The dog's going to quarter back and forth from row to row or from one side of the field to the other side of the field, depending on the scenario. But that's exactly what the dog's going to do. He's going to work the winds, get as much of the scent cone as he can till he gets it narrowed down to that, that pinpoint to where the bird is. And I always tell people when we're guiding that my dogs, my retrievers are trained to put the bird up or bring it back. If that bird is not cooperating and will not bust out of its cover, my dog will go in the cover, grab that bird and bring it back. That's their job. That is, that is their job. Yeah. And, and again, that kind of illustrates the, that point that, that we made a few minutes ago that Flushing breeds are, are very commonly going to launch into the air and try to grab that bird because just like Matt mentioned, their sole job is to get that bird and bring it back. It's a lot of fun to watch too. When the dog really starts to get birdie and they bust into the cover, I've seen it more often where the rooster or the hen pops out of the cover followed almost immediately by one of my dogs. It's almost like the scene from Jaws. It's an amazing <laughs> thing to see. Oh, that's great. And so again, upon noticing that the dogs start to get birdie, exhibiting some of those characteristics that, that Matt just kind of discussed. And if you notice, he said that the dog is going to, to kind of hook and that's just the way that the dogs are kind of trained. Um, so they want to find that, that scent cone, begin to narrow it down. And then they're going to, once they, they get to a point where that scent cone is very narrow and they have a pretty good idea of where that bird is, they're gonna to start to rush in. Um, and again, unlike a pointing breed, they're not gonna sit there and indicate and allow you to catch up. And so that's why it's so important for us as hunters when we're working with flushing breeds is to be up right on the dog and within that, that kind of 30 to 50 yards to make sure that when it does flush, it's within that range. Again, we there don't want to shoot. Oh. I, I would interject there that there is absolutely nothing uh, as, as pretty as watching a pointer going on point but there's nothing as exciting as watching a flusher bust into cover and put up two roosters at the same time. It's just, it's a beautiful thing to see. I, I agree with that. And again, when that bird does flush, we want to avoid shooting over the dog. Um, so that's why it's really important for us to, to, again, be in a position that when you expect that dog to flush that bird, that you're in a position to where you can take a safe and effective shot. And so oftentimes that means being somewhat adjacent to the dog 
and being within that kind of 30 to 50 yard guideline, depending on your, your shot shell selection um, and your choke tube and your, your comfortability taking those shots, um, you'll, you'll kind of know what that effective range is. Um, again, I stress this multiple times, but allow that bird to gain in elevation um, before shooting. I've seen multiple instances where the dog will launch up and come back to the ground with a mouthful of tail feathers. And if you were to happen to take a shot at that point, that, that's a very dangerous scenario for the dog. So allow that dog to get good clearance uh, between it and the dog. Yep, so here's basically just what I said um, in another summary. Just again, look for that blue belly beneath the sky. Now, most flushing dogs, and, and uh, Matt, feel free to interject here as, as you see fit, but most flushing dogs are going to immediately start following the flight of the bird after it flushes. Um, unlike a pointing breed where he's going to sit there and hold point until that shot kind of releases him. Uh, but that bird dog is going to be watching that, that bird fly and he's going to be immediately tracking it. Um, there, are, uh, there are certain trainers that will teach a lab to sit on the flush uh, just for safety reasons. Um, give that bird a chance to get up, get shot, and then the dog will then mark it. Uh, my dogs are not trained to sit on the flush. They will bust the bird up, will shoot it, and they'll be as close to being directly underneath it when the bird comes down as they can be. Um, it's a matter of preference. The majority of the people that we guide for uh, follow your advice. You see blue sky under the bird's belly before they shoot. So I see no reason to, to teach a dog to be steady on the flush. That's a good point. And again, immediately after that shot, you want to return your firearm to a safe position, unload it. Um, and again, this is where it's really important to, to be watching where that bird goes down. Like Matt said, chances are that dog is going to be right underneath the bird as it's kind of falling to the ground. Uh, but in some cases, they might lose line of sight or there might be an obstruction where they kind of have to run around maybe a you know, a little swamp or, or something that just kind of breaks up their path. So it's important as you see that bird going towards the ground that you try to visualize where you last saw it hit the ground um, because you may have to give some guidance um, to, to try to recover that bird. And again, um, basically the, the same concept as, as the pointers, they will then, you know, retrieve the bird. Um, don't give the commands to the dog, let the handler take control of that, that situation. Um, and again, it's, it's, like Matt said, hunting over flushing breeds is, is he, he kind of said it perfectly. It's exciting. We're watching a, a pointing breed can be beautiful. Um, and and I, I think the, the recovering aspect is, is particularly interesting to watch um, with, with a, a flushing breed or retriever, because again, they're very oftentimes directly underneath that bird. And so that retrieve is, is kind of very, very quick. It, it's very quick. Yes. And more often than not, that dog will bring it directly back to the handler because to teach a dog to market those distances takes a great deal of training. We also train for the uh, AKC and HRC games. Um, so the dog is, is, is learned, uh, taught how to mark at great distances, even close distances. So because of all the training that goes into it, that dog is only going to retrieve to the handler. Excellent. And now with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jason and he's going to kind of discuss some of the basics. If you're interested in kind of moving forward and, and kind of, you know, choosing a dog breed, we'll kind of discuss that. And any of our guest speakers, if you want to kind of chime in at this point, um, this, this would be a great time to just kind of give some of your feedback because um, a, a lot of our uh, guest speakers have, have spent a lot of time working with various different breeds. Um, and so this will be a good opportunity to, to discuss some of these various breeds. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Dan. Um, so yes, yeah, so we we went over in this slide we slideshow we had listed um, 24 different breeds, 12 of each, and um, there's plenty more. So before you go choosing your breed, you want to know uh, what type of hunting you're planning on doing. Uh, if you're more of the flushing style hunter, or if you think the pointing style hunter is more your speed. And then uh, you're going to want to research each dog breed and try to see if that's the type of dog for your household along with your hunt. So you want to see if uh, you have any other animals in your house, uh, other dogs, other cats, other animals, um, children, 
so you want to make sure that this type of dog is for you. And there, there's so much research out there now that you can go and look at. Um, we saw one good one actually was Pheasants Forever has this web page where this URL can be put in the chat by Adam. Um, so you guys can go check this out, but they list 35 different hunting breeds and they have them separated into flushers and to pointers. And they give you the breakdown of kind of the history of the dogs, but also the personality of the different breeds. And they tend to hold true. Um, again, within the breed, you'll have that range of activity and energy um, that with that certain dog, um, because it's going to be an individual dog. So it's good to, if you can have a dog for a little bit and try it out before taking it might be an option. Uh, I know we just adopted a Springer Spaniel from the Ezra, which is the English Springer Spaniel Rescue of America. And we were able to foster that dog before we accepted it and brought it in to our home. So that was, that worked well for us. So there's a lot of options out there when trying to find a, a dog. Um, you can do, look for rescues. You can find these pure breeds in rescues, uh, but you can also go to these breeders and you get these long lines of, of hunting dogs as well. That's definitely part of the hunting culture as well. Uh, so uh, I'll open it up. I'll start with Matt so that we're not all talking at once, but Matt, what has been uh, your experience with people being interested in trying to find a bird dog? One of the first things we tell people to check are the genetics and the pedigree. If you're looking for a high drive, full blown, energetic upland dog, you're going to want to look at a breeder that specializes in that style. If you're looking for a dog that's going to hunt with you occasionally, uh, you more of a, an intermediate hunter. Um, like uh, you know, two, three times a month, you're going to go out and hunt. The rest of the time, it's going to be a house dog. You definitely want to look at the, the pedigree that is going to reflect that style dog. You don't want to go to a high drive breeder for a house dog. That just will be a, that dog will end up in a shelter. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they see a, a dog and it's very pretty and they like the puppy and they don't realize that that puppy is going to become an 80 pound dog very quickly and they have no idea how to control it. You have to do the research on the parents, the grandparents and so forth. We try to go at least five generations back. Great, yeah. Um, so again, like I said, that pedigree is uh, important, especially when you're trying to find a, the certain dog that you're interested in for sure. And then those, they know, um, when you have that five generations back, they have a very good idea of what the personality of that dog is going to be and, uh, and the energy level of it. Uh, Perry, do you have any suggestions on people trying to find dogs? Yeah. Uh, first is just do your research. You know, do not be in a rush right now, you know, with what's been going on with the pandemic there, people are adopting, you know, they're rescuing dogs they're trying to buy puppies and they're, and they're rushing in, into, they're rushing into decisions. Everything looks great on a website. Um, try and get as many referrals from that breeder if you can't. That you can. If you can't get referrals, there's probably a reason why they're not giving them to you. Uh, most of the most the, the reputable breeders that I know, there's at least a year to a two year wait list. You know, you should not be getting a, a sporting dog. A, on a um, on an impulse, you know, they're not an impulse purchase. With the pointing breeds, there's there's differences between the breeds. Again, take your time. You know, do your research. Uh, there's local clubs in the Illinois area for probably about six or seven of the most popular pointing breeds. They can tell you what the slight differences are, and then even within the breed. So for example, my breed, short hair, you have field trial bred short hairs. These are dogs that are bred to be hunting at two, three, four hundred yards. Well, you know, we, we don't really need that here. So then you, you can have more of a, uh, of a gun dog who will be hunting at 50 yards. Um, the, so again, just ask as many questions, get as many references as you can. But the last thing is, and I think Matt kind of touched on this also, is if you're not going to hunt a lot, if you're not going to have a lot of time to train, 
don't don't necessarily say to yourself, well, you know, I'm only going to be able to hunt a few times a year. I don't need to spend a lot of money on a dog. And from everything that I've heard from listening to the pros, it's exactly the opposite is you want to buy the best dog, the best breeding that you could afford, because that dog is going to come with the genetics is going to come with the natural ability. If you're a pro where you're able to get that dog out a lot, you're able to work with it a lot. You're able to get it on a lot of birds and it's a mediocre dog. You could wring everything possible out of that dog by giving it all that experience. If you don't get out a lot, you're, you're going to, you want to depend on that dog's breeding to make up for your lack of time in the field. And, and I've, you know, I've heard this, I'm hearing this more and more, uh, you know, just listening to different pros. You know. Sure. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, Perry. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, putting your money up front so that way what you lack in training, the dog has and just personality and, and natural ability. It's something to consider when looking for dogs in the future. Um, yeah, I, yep. Go ahead, Katie. Jason, yeah, I got, you want to talk I got about one how more you're... thing on that. Go ahead. Um, we kind of touched on it. We talked about pedigree and all that. If you're looking for a good hunting dog, no matter what the breed, you're going to most likely, if you your best chance is to put a little money forward, one, because you know the pedigree, but also a lot of these breeders do genetic tests. There's a lot of recessive diseases in these dogs. Um, there's a lot of diseases in any purebred dog or any uh, lab or any shelter mix that you would find. It's just part of life. But um, there are a lot of genetic tests out there that you're testing the parents to make sure, you know, they're not going to carry these. And it might be genetic diseases that don't pop up in the dog's life until you've had them for five to six years and have gotten bonded with them. Um, or it might be that they have dysplasia. Um, so you're going to, a good hunting dog, you, you need to expect to spend some money. Um, definitely what, you know, get those referrals. Um, if they're not willing to show you health tests and they're not willing to give you referrals, there's probably a reason, um, like they said, you, it's very big red flags. Um, but on top of that, my biggest thing is meet more than one of the breed you're interested in. A lot of people will meet one dog of a certain breed and say, oh, I met a good one. He was so cool and he was so nice. He might be the outlier. He might not be the normal dog of characteristics, breed characteristics for that dog. Um, so meet as many as you can. There's a lot of, you know, go to field test, um, pheasants forever. When we have pheasant fest, um, we have bird dog alley, which will have almost every single one of these bird dog breeds mentioned here. And you can meet multiple of the breeds up close and personal and talk to experienced people. Um, so go to, it's not the best place, but go to dog shows. If there's dog shows around, you can see them there. Um, the dogs at dog shows are not going to be the same as dogs hunting, but you can at least meet a few and get a little bit of a general idea of what they're like. Um, so it is a lot of research. Um, but my biggest thing is also, if you're going to get a dog, listen to the breeder and take the dog, tell the breeder what you want to do with that dog and take the puppy that the breeder recommends for you um, because they've been with that puppy every single day for eight weeks of its life um, so they're going to know which one's the birdiest they're going to know which one's going to be the best to go if you have kids um, they're going to know that puppy a lot better than you getting to meet it that one time so if they're suggesting one that you don't think is the cutest maybe listen to them because they might know a little bit better because that cute one might be a psycho <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> I get that a lot with my puppies. Oh, I want that one with the blaze. Yeah, no, he's going to drive you up the wall. <laughs> Great advice, guys. Thank you so much for uh, putting in your two cents on that one. Um, all right, so moving on, we're going to go quick through equipment here. Um, like anything with hunting and any other outdoor activity, there's plenty of equipment that you can purchase. Uh, so common ones that you can have would be, uh, we've, we're going to talk a little bit about training in the next couple slides, but they do have bird scent if you can't get your hands on uh, a bird or a bird wing. Uh, so you can use that on dummies and uh, or uh, and on canvas dummies and bumpers. But uh, so then we have dummies and bumpers. They have ones that are shaped like birds and that give it a, kind of the real feel of having a neck and everything attached to it. And they have ones that are just your canvas dummies that hold up uh, for a long period of time. 
then you have uh, like a starting pistol or a test pistol, some type of uh, pistol that allows them to get used to hearing a bang and associating that with uh, your, a bird falling. Um, so you can use that to get your dog used to hearing loud noises. They also have the e-tracking collar. Uh, so those are your GPS collars they have now. They also have uh, training collars where the collar would be, uh, it has a, usually have three, three modes of electric shock, um, the sound and vibration. Uh, most of the trainers uh, I know barely use the electric shock. They usually use the sound and the vibration on their dogs. Uh, then you have the regular ID collar um, that you can have on your animal uh, that you should have on all your pets. Then we have the high vis vest or harness. That way you can see your animal as it runs through the tall grasses. Then you have leashes and long lines. So long lines would be leashes that can range from 10 foot, 30 foot or 50 foot length that you can use when training out in the field. Then of course, just your general things to have with your dog when you're going out and doing a lot of walking around. You wanna have your dog bowl, possibly some food with you, a water bowl or water bottle and you can train with a whistle and there's different types of whistles you can get um, low low end and high end whistles depending on what you're into and you can also have your crate or your kennel with you along with uh, an important one that people might forget is a first aid kit for their dog uh, i've seen some dogs go through some pretty thick stuff and come out pretty scratched up so it's good to have uh, a first aid kit with you in case anything happens um if you nope. could go back for a second we have a, a question from travis that i think will fit really well here and I I'd, I'd like to get um, some opinions from both Matt Perry and, and Katie as well on this. Um, Travis asks, is it better to use a wing or carrier pigeon um, when you're training? And just kind of quickly give your, your kind of thoughts on, on whether you use scent, you use bird wings. Um, yeah. Anybody want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, actually I'll jump into that. So a wing or a live bird, uh, there's no, as as far as I'm, there's no comparison. Uh, we prefer to use pigeons because uh, they're, they're strong flyers and they have a, they have a game bird scent. Uh, you know, when your dog is young, they're going to point uh, a pointing. They're going to point anything. They're going to point sparrows, blackbirds, and it's just kind of neat to watch them as they mature. They learn to just ignore those birds entirely. But uh, but pigeons just common pigeons that uh, either if you have someone that's raising homing pigeons or just trapping wild pigeons under a viaduct somewhere, they have the, the same scent as a game bird. So our dogs will point them. The, what's very important though, is that they will not catch them. Uh, even when you're using, because we can't find pigeons, we wind up purchasing pen raised quail, even uh, sometimes pen raised chucker, their flush is not as predictable, is not always as strong as a pigeon, so the dogs can catch them. Uh, Matt had mentioned earlier that it's okay for his dogs to go in and, and grab a pheasant when they're hunting. If we're just hunting with our dogs, same thing, it's not a problem. If we're doing um, testing and competitions, that's like the last thing <laughs> That we want with a pointing dog just for it to go in and grab a bird. But I would um, I would only use a wing for like a retrieving drill. So you know we'll, we'll, use, we'll use the wings for the younger dogs because it's much easier to get them excited about something a little more controlled with that kind of scent. And as the dog matures we can put them on clipped wing chucker. Uh, I do like the explosive flush of a chucker you are right though sometimes they're they're unpredictable and they can be captured and a young dog in a retrieving aspect catching a chucker is not a bad thing for us because more often than not they will bring it back to us and that kind of gives us a uh, double success if you will yeah i was gonna say i think the only time we ever really use wings um, we'll use them occasionally, but most of the time when we're using a wing, it's to evaluate seven to eight week old puppies. Um, the adult dogs kind of get over it real fast and uh, live birds are definitely the best way to go if, once you get them a little older. Um, 
only issue we've ever had with live birds and young, young puppies is they sometimes can scare them a little bit if they're, but that's really, really young. Great. Okay, so kind of going back into training. Um, so there's different ways to train your dog. Um, you can send them away to a training camp. And uh, so you would actually give your dog away and then well, not away, but like you let them take it and then they train it up for you. And then uh, you get it back and it's all trained up. And then there's also working one-on-one -on -one with a trainer, uh, which uh, allows you to also be trained as a dog handler uh, and with your dog. And then there's home training where you uh, research it yourself and, and try to train your dog uh, at home. And uh, just reminding everybody that training is a constant effort and uh, trying to keep your dog um, excited and, and challenged. So uh, and it's never over. So as your dog goes out through its career of being a hunter, uh, you're constantly trying to reinforce all these different things. Uh, and then uh, there's also organizations that host training days. And so you can hook up with one of those people and uh, try to get training done there. Um, I know Matt is a trainer. Matt, do you have any suggestions on people trying to get their dog trained up? Yeah, um, start early and be consistent. Those are the two biggest things that I always tell people. Start early. There is no such thing as too early. When you first get your dog home, uh, teaching a pup to sit is a great idea. Teaching a dog his name recognition and the kennel training and so forth. I mean, that, uh, that all begins the moment the pup comes home. And always end your training sessions on a positive note. That's really... That's, I mean, we, this, this is a totally different webinar that can take another two, three, four days, actually. Absolutely. There's right. so much information yeah. that can be shared, but the basics are just that. Start early, start early, be consistent, and always end positive. Sure. Uh, Perry, do you have any other suggestions to build off that? That's pretty good encapsulation yeah, if, of training. If you can, it, sure. If, if you can, um, I, I know like Matt, uh, he when I listened to a podcast that he was on, he talked about a, uh, uh, these training groups that I, I guess he supervises. If you could find a club, um, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a breed club that, that does training activities. Uh, that's a great way to get started. Uh, NAVDA, North America, North American Versatile Hunting Dog uh, Association, those, those clubs, that's really... 90% of what they exist for is most of them will have monthly training groups. Uh, my club, the short hair club, we probably have the most the number of train of group training sessions that probably more than all the other pointing dog clubs in our area combined. And we actually welcome people with other pointing dogs. We have uh, pointers, we have Vishlas, we have Weimarimers, uh, in our group, I mean, it's all the same basic training for a pointing dog. Um, and, and what Matt had talked, what Matt had mentioned consistency, what I would add to consistency is especially if you're new, everybody is going to be telling you what to do and everybody is right and everybody's wrong. Uh, so try and try and find a system, whether it's a system that, that your club follows and try and have some consistency by staying with a particular training system you know you could still get bits and pieces from everywhere and, and find what fits for you but again it's also you know agreeing with Matt we could spend you know weeks uh you know talking about different training systems and things like that sure sure uh, uh, Katie, uh, uh, Katie do you have anything to add on to that too um definitely you know earlier, the better. Um, if you've got a, you know, a three-year-old dog that's never hunted, it's not the end of the world, but it's going to be a lot, you know, the old saying, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. It's, it's going to be harder to teach that old dog. Um, and getting them, you know, I personally, what my family does is we will start our dogs off until about six to eight months. Um, we'll then send them out to um, training camp because, which is, very expensive and even then you got to do your research on your dog training camps because um they're depending on what your breed is that trainer might not be the best dog for your breed um so once you find a good training camp we we send them there and they'll stay about 
three months at a training camp and then they're come back to us and we're running drills with them. We start running drills with them in May and they're going all year until hunting season. And even then once hunting season's done that time between end of hunting season and May, they're still doing stuff. It's a consistent thing that we do with them to keep them sharp just for that hunting time. Great. Sure. Yep. Training is never ending there, huh? Uh, okay, moving on to uh, if you don't own a dog, uh, don't feel bad because one, you can always just go out into a field and kick brush, but you can also find people who do own dogs. So uh, there are, are a bunch of organizations and ways to go about doing that. Uh, a lot of times, uh, especially in Illinois here, if you want to go public land hunting, you can win a lottery and you can take people with you. So you can reach out after you get access to a public land site. Uh, and you can ask around and I'm sure a handler would be happy to come along with you with their dog and to hunt with you on your, on your tags there. And uh, so that's always an option to look into that and we'll go over those different avenues for you here. So you can look around at local hunting clubs and they may have people that are part of the hunting club that have experienced dogs. You can also look at different hunting organizations like Pheasants Forever and ask them if they have anyone in your region that has a good hunting dog that you can go and take out with. You can look at the bird dog breed clubs like the GSP Club of Illinois. Uh, then you can also look at your local state land. So you can call up that particular site that does a controlled pheasant hunt. And they've had people that hunt on their sites for years. And that site manager may know somebody to put you in contact with or to at least reference with. Uh, then if you ever go to an outfitter, uh, either in state or out of state, uh, the out of state ones that are classic Upland bird sites are going to be your South, North Dakota, Kansas, Iowa. Uh, all those outfitters were going to have a dog with you. So if you're excited to get out, um, those guys out there will, will definitely have some experienced dogs for you to use. Um, Perry, do you have any uh, other suggestions on how people can try to reach out and find people who have dogs? Yep. I would start with, with the local clubs. Uh, again, in Illinois, there's probably about six uh, pointing, you know, dedicated pointing breed clubs. Uh, also, I'm not sure how do. You, when would you want me to spend a few minutes talking about the uh, controlled pheasant hunt program and right now. someone that way? This, yeah, sure. Go for it. So, so I um, spend a lot of time hunting at the Des Plaines State Fish and Wildlife Area. That's in Wilmington. That's the closest. Uh, so they there's uh, probably about 16 or 18 different sites in Illinois that have what's called a controlled pheasant hunt program. So it's a state sponsored program. And, you know, frankly, for Northern Illinois, that is pheasant hunting. Uh, there's, there's no, there's really no public land available out here uh, with wild pheasant populations other than a few of the habitat areas, which, um, but the controlled pheasant hunt programs, these are these are pen raised birds, very very high quality. Uh, they are better. They are closer to wild birds behaving like wild pheasants than anything that I've ever seen at a at a private club. Uh, but you know they're not what you're going to see out in North Dakota or, or South Dakota. But you can go on the website. You can actually one of the groups that I'm in, that I'm also involved with the Friends of Displains, www.friendsofdisplains, e e s p l a i n e s dot org. Uh, right on the front page there, there's instructions on how to register online to get a permit for a controlled pheasant hunt area, and um, for displays, if you're interested, Dan will share my email. Uh, I have six, I have about six or seven experienced hunters or handlers who have volunteered to take out new hunters. So we want to encourage everybody to, to join us at displays. And uh, we're, and these guys are all experienced, they know the area. And they're happy to, you know, they're all going to tell you that their dogs are the best thing, are the, you know, the best thing on four legs. But um, we could, and again, Dan can give you my information on, uh, and I'll be happy to try and match you up with somebody. Yeah, so if anybody is interested in potentially going on a, a mentored hunt, 
um, at Des Plaines State Fish and Wildlife Area, which is again, a little south side of Chicago. Um, I put my email address in the chat. It's danieljs at illinois.edu. And if you just email me and let, you, let me know that you're interested in Perry's offer, um, I'll go ahead and kind of connect you two. And the, I, I'll go ahead and, and say, this is a, a great opportunity and I hope multiple people take him up on that. Um, I know I, I see a few familiar faces in the chat um, who have actually previously gone on a mentored hunt with Perry. And one individual I know shortly bought a, a German short hair pointer directly after that. that yeah, so, so. So, so apparently he wasn't too thrilled with my dog. So he had to go out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so if again if you are interested in taking up perry's offer on a, a mentored controlled pheasant hunt just shoot me an email and we'll be happy to, to connect you up fantastic um katie would you like to talk a little bit about how people can use pheasants forever to try to find connections yeah so um pheasants forever and quail forever um we have uh, about 60 approximately 65 chapters located throughout the state um, they're made up of volunteers, so uh, what our volunteers focus on a lot is habitat and outreach. So for most of the, a lot of the year we're doing things like um, learn to shoot events. We'll also, um, we have it that our volunteers, it's a little bit different than a lot of other hunting organizations, is our volunteers actually get to keep the funds that are raised. Um, they get to keep everything besides membership dues. That's the only money that goes up to headquarters. So. Um, they get to keep the money locally and determine how to use it. So um, on top of doing habitat projects, our chapters will spend a lot of money doing outreach, um, learn to shoots um, in the fall. Um, it's been affected a little bit due to COVID. Um, we usually do have a lot of mentor hunts. Um, some of them are youth, some of them are open to adults. Um, so if you have, you know, find your local chapter, if they do a um, an adult mentor hunt or an open mentor hunt, that's a great way because they have the dogs, they have the birds, um, they have people that are experienced there to help teach you. But um, even if the chapter doesn't do a mentor hunt, um, they're obviously interested in bird hunting um, or habitat for a reason. So a lot of them are hunters um, and they do go out a lot. So that is a great way to find, you know, somebody that um, has a most likely has a dog, has experienced hunting, um, I know there's a couple chapters throughout the state that have been having people offer to them. You say, hey, I'm interested and they will, if they don't have an event going on there, they have people within the chapter that they can send you to that can take you out and um, teach you. Um, and they're gonna be really excited too if you've got a, a state permit and they don't have one, they're gonna definitely hit you up on that if you've got one of those and you need a dog. Um, I don't know many guys that are gonna turn that down, so. Sure. Uh, Matt, um, do you have any experience with uh, your clients or yourself going out with uh, people who may not have dogs? Yeah, we've had a number of people reach out to our chapter and just ask the question, is anybody available to teach me or take me? And we've helped a number of people. Uh, we mentioned Bong, as we were talking earlier, uh, in Wisconsin. We've taken a number of people up there just to introduce them to the sport. If they've never shot before, we have a couple of facilities where we can bring somebody in and teach them the uh, uh, the intro to the hunter safety, uh, how to handle a shotgun, when to shoot, when not to shoot, all of those things. We, we've done quite a few of those actually. Uh, and fortunately for us, these people have become active members in our chapter. So I would recommend if you are going to reach out to your chapter, expect them to ask you to join the chapter because they're going to need all the help they can get just to carry this forward. Gotcha. And great. I want to give one more quick pitch about, you know, joining some of these local organizations and a few of them, a few of the, the comments have kind of hit on it, but one of the biggest benefits of, of joining these organizations is just meeting like-minded individuals to share a passion for, for being outdoors and a passion for upland hunting and upland habitat and watching these dogs work. And so, you know, even if, if you're more experienced hunter, joining these, these local chapters is, is really beneficial to, to yourself as a hunter. Um, you're going to meet more people. It's going to increase your, your chances of potentially, you know, more opportunity to hunt. Um, so definitely look into to joining some of these local organizations. Mm -hmm. So, um, some quick questions to ask yourself as you are going to reach out to somebody who does own a dog and you, you may be a new hunter or a hunter that doesn't have a dog. 
uh, reaching out to these folks, you're going to want to give yourself plenty of time to plan this hunt. And I mean, you can imagine trying to go hunting with new people is intimidating to some people. Uh, there's some safety concerns and some personal concerns you need to take into consideration when going and hunting with someone you may not know. Uh, but then also just general experience level. And you need you should iron this out before you, you meet them in the field. So just some things to consider would be like your experience level that you have. Um, and then uh, what location of the state you would like to hunt in and see if they're in that region that you are interested in hunting in. And to see uh, um, like how long of a day you're wanting to go for, uh, your, your, how, uh, if you can walk that, how far you can walk and what they're expecting of you, uh, what terrain you can walk through, if you can walk through really tall grass or if you need to walk through some shorter grass and that might help you pick out a spot to go hunting with them. And uh, if you have the right equipment um, before heading out. So all those things, just, just things to consider before reaching out to someone and just uh, kind of going from the seat of your pants. So it's good to plan ahead and have a hunt plan uh, put into place before right. reaching out to someone without knowing to anything at all and uh, expecting them to, to help you out there. So just things to consider. So with that, um, that's gonna conclude our Upland series for now and um this is going to conclude the bird, bird dog 101 again uh, for more information on learn to hunt you can look at our website and follow us on facebook as well as other social media outlets so instagram and youtube uh, same goes for the pheasants forever and again follow them on facebook and uh, their website there so you can again try to become a member of a chapter there to be more up to date on what they're doing in your area and our upcoming webinars right now, we have to meet up and discuss what we're going to be doing. So we have our November list coming out soon. Uh, you can find that when we have it posted. We'll put that on our Facebook page and on our website. And you can register for those just as you registered for this one. And again, I failed to mention this in the beginning, but uh, just by registering for these webinars, you will get a copy of this PowerPoint and a recording of the webinar. So please Look out for that in your emails. And also you will get that if you can't make a webinar. So if you just register for it, we'll send that along to you. So that way you can have no excuse to not have any of the information that you want. And uh, so there you go. Also, we'll be sending out a survey too. So so uh, in those emails, so if you can fill out the surveys, those help our program out by us understanding what you guys need more information on. So those will help us develop our webinars in the future. So take a couple minutes to fill those out and we would appreciate that very much. So with the time remaining, uh, we can do any questions and answers for these uh, special guests that we have today. Yeah, so we have, like, like Jason mentioned, a few minutes for questions. Um, I do just wanna give a, a huge thank you to, to Katie, to Matt and to Perry for assisting us with this webinar tonight. I think they provided a lot of valuable experience um, and, and, and different you know, techniques and strategies. So I, I, I really commend them and thank them for, for spending the time with us tonight. Um, but yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, we'll stay for about five, six more minutes and then we'll, um, we'll call it a night. So if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. So there's actually two questions that people ask that I'd be interested to, um, even though they're pointer related, I'd be interested to hear Matt's and Perry's thoughts on it. Cause um, every dog I've ever got, and I've had them from eight weeks old, but there's was one question regarding, you know, getting a one-year-old pointer and then a six-month-old pointer um, introducing to birds or getting them out into the field. If, um, how would you guys go about that with an adult dog test, testing to see if they even have the instincts and the ability to go out? Uh, you want me, I, I could go first on that. My, my first dog was a rescue. Uh, he, we got him as a, as a, a pet. Uh, I had no background, no interest in hunting. Uh, he was probably about a year old. Uh, we went, we joined the German Short Hair Pointer Club of Illinois. Uh, we went out to one of their uh, hunting tests. And I personally, I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. After that, we brought my dog out in the field just on a, on a check cord, on a 20 foot uh, cord. And he went not. I mean, he knew what to do. He just started uh, quartering back and forth. I mean, I'd never seen so much excitement in my life. So I think, you know, again, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a pro. It really depends on the dog. There's no reason 
that you couldn't start with an older dog. It just, I, I think it's just really going to depend on the dog. And I would, if you have an opportunity, work with, with a trainer, you know, like Matt or, you know, a pointing dog trainer, you know, they, they will probably have some ideas, uh, you know, they can put some birds out and see what kind of interest level the dog has with that. Um, with short hairs, you know, it, it depends on, on who you got that dog from. I mean, there's some breeders that are very, very active breeders in Illinois that I would never recommend. Um, I mean, I've seen dogs of theirs that have no interest whatsoever in a bird. Um, so you, you just have to be careful, but if you're starting with an older dog, yeah, there definitely are ways to see if they have, if they have any interest in the dog. I think you kind of trailed off on that one. I agree. Um, my personal opinion is most any dog can hunt. It's in their DNA. What level do you want that dog to hunt at? That would be the question to ask. If you just want this dog to go out and pick up birds from time to time, sure. Uh, a, a dog six years of age could be taught to do that. It all depends on the level of training you're looking for or, or the level, what's, what's your expectation of the pup? Thank you, Matt. Hey, Matt, if uh, you wouldn't mind, you can do a shameless plug real fast if you wanna talk a little bit about your, uh, your training and uh, your business that you have. Oh, sure, thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, overall retriever training, uh, we, we can take most any dog, as I mentioned, and uh, teach it obedience to hunt test training, to waterfowl, to upland training. Um, uh, no puppies too young, no puppies too old. Uh, with, with COVID, we found that a lot of people are spending more and more time at home with their dog and they realize their dog really isn't the little angel they thought it was. Uh, so our, our phones have been ringing off the hook about obedience. My dog won't come when he's called. Um, what do I do when the dog is jumping on the neighbors every time they come to the door? The holidays are coming up and family's coming to, to visit. How do I teach my dog to be more respectful when strangers come home? Things like that. Uh, this is all stuff that we can help with. As the year progresses, uh, coming into, uh, we'll say spring, we'll be changing our focus towards hunt tests. A lot of our clients are repeat clients. We'll take the dog in and teach them to run at a started to master level. Um, there, there isn't a heck of a lot we can't do for you. You know, if I could jump in, you know, Matt just mentioned what, what I'd like to do, if, if you think you're interested in a, a pointing breed dog in the spring and the fall, so in April and in September, pretty much every weekend at the Des Plaines State Fish and Wildlife Area, um, you know, just south of Joliet, the different pointing breed clubs are hosting uh, AKC hunting test. So you'll see dogs everywhere from a uh, uh, a junior level dog, which is basic, which could be anywhere from someone. I've, I've had people come out there and literally they've said this the first time I've had my dog on field. Um, so those are beginner dogs. They're, they're being judged on their pretty much their natural ability, their desire to hunt, their ability to find birds to master level dog, which uh, one friend of mine has described them as overtrained hunting dogs. Uh, artificial it's it's a much higher level than you would even need for hunting but it can give you an opportunity to see what a, a pointing dog looks like in a hunting situation these are um all the dogs judged in a general field hunting situation you could meet there'll be pros out there there'll be breeders there'll be representatives Hey Perry, you're, you're going out again. I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. I'm, but um, you could find those tests uh, on our website, the gspci.org. Uh, we usually have a listing under under uh, other events 
for all the local clubs uh, that are listing their their events in primarily in uh, April and in September. Perfect. Uh, we had one more question. If uh, someone wants to take this, would a blue tick hound make a decent bird dog? Um, does anyone have any experience working with blue tick hounds? I personally have not, although I do, I do find the breed that they're handsome dogs. They are. They are. I would say test them and see how he turns out. One of the best pheasant dogs I ever hunted behind was a, uh, a pointer pit bull mix. And then one of the best duck dogs I've ever seen was a, uh, um, oh, not the toy, but the middle-sized poodle. And she made all the labs. She showed the labs what was up that day. So. <laughs> <laughs> so poodles are the original water dogs. So that makes sense. Yep. So, you know, you never know until you try it. Um, probably going to be a great coon dog or, you know, maybe a squirrel dog, but there's a lot of dogs that can do squirrels and coons and then go and do upland too. So at the very least to look great in the field. <laughs> yeah, send, send us some pictures into pheasants forever. Cause we, <laughs> that would definitely be a <laughs> one for us. <laughs> all right. Well with that, I think that concludes uh, tonight's webinar. Again, if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach us, reach out to us at any time. And if it's a question we can't answer, uh, we'll happily defer it to, to Matt Perry um, or Katie and, and try to get that answer for you. Um, so again, thanks for joining us tonight and hope you have a, a wonderful evening. Oh, I saw we had one last minute question. Any training opportunities in Western Illinois? Um, Katie, I know you've spent a little bit of time over in Western Illinois. Do you know of any training opportunities out there off the top of your head? Most of the training opportunities I know are more central. Um, around the Quad Cities, I think there is a dog group there that does some hunting training. They might actually be on the Iowa side of the border and do a lot there. Um, I would look at NAVDA. They have a bunch of field days. Their Spoon River group um, is kind of towards the um, Western side too. So um, I would check with them for their, their training days. Perfect. All right, well, thanks again to Matt, Katie and Perry for joining us tonight. And I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you, guys. Thank you.